That's nice of you to all come during your lunch break, especially on a Friday. I, I talked with quite a lot of people that said, okay, I might leave on Friday to just have an additional day off on the weekend. But no, this is, uh, this is very pleasant. Thank you for being here. So um, I'm going to talk about that letter cues and event-driven systems, as becomes clearly from the title. Before we dive into that, I'll do a very short bit about myself. So uh, I'm Steven. I'm from the Netherlands. And I work for Exonic. And what I do for Exonic is that I'm the lead developer for Exxon Framework. Now, I know that some of you have a clue what it is, but perhaps some don't. So let's first start a little bit about what Exxon Framework really is. So Exxon Framework is a Java-based open source library or framework that provides you building blocks to build a message-driven architecture inside your monolith or microservices, so you will. With that basis, we support means like command query responsibility separation, so CQRS, domain-driven design, or DDD for short, and event sourcing. But at the core of this all is message-driven styles, like event-driven systems. As a maintainer of this project, of Exxon Framework, we get a lot of requests about things that might bug you when they're using it, or features they are thinking about, or other types of enhancements. So eventually, as part of the event-driven logic we had in place, the requests arose, hey, how are we going to deal with the exceptions we have in this logic? How can we resolve this in a nice and fashionable way? So we went on the journey to design a dead letter queue for the framework. So this is a little bit what I'm going to try to do in this short time span I have, take you on the journey that we had. I'm not really going to show any code. It's more on a conceptual level because, well, well, if I go dive into the actual API, I definitely need more than 50 minutes. <laughs> so if you do have questions about that, feel free to come up afterwards. For now, we're just going to start with the basics. What I tend to do when I start so off something like this is that I'm going to look up the definitions of the things I'm going to build. I prefer that from a naming perspective as well, that I have a clue, okay, this makes sense in this context, or it should be something else. So I started off with, well, you might have guessed it at that letter because th that is the thing we're going to queue. So what does it mean to be a dead letter? It's actually pretty short. It's just a thing of mail, an item, very physical really, that could not be delivered or, well, just didn't happen, was incapable to send it over to the recipient. As a result, that, well, dead letter is put on a, on a pile, maybe a retry that alerted the stage, but likely in the past this was just simply destroyed because you couldn't find the recipient. Okay, we could use this. Maybe this has some, some clues of what we're going to do with the API that you're going to drop things or you're going to retry, right? So you attach the logic of queuing as well, because we have a dead letter queue. This led me up to, well, the only thing I could really find was a Wikipedia page, which did link me to some architectural documents. And I put the main snippet out here that it's a service implementation that you use in message queuing systems or message driven systems for messages that could not or should not be delivered to their recipient, again. So this is a bit more valuable. I have a guess that quite a lot of us already know this concept. Well, we're all in, in IT, I assume. You have heard about the dead letter queue, but I always think it's very important to get this basis right. So I started off with this, and now I'm gonna, well, introduce very slowly the, uh, the things I think are important from an event-driven style in here. So when you think about event-driven systems, it can be very basic in that there's one component publishing events, there are some technical aspect in the middle, the message source or the event source, and then there are another component called the event consumers. You might have guessed it, the publisher is where you, well, append the events to the source, and the consumer is where you process the events from the source. I'm not going to dive into the source because this is a technicality. You can change what type of source you use underneath. We're really looking from a framework perspective, or as an open source framework, from the publisher or the consumer's perspective. So this is very straightforward, but there's one thing that is important on this note, and that the consumer does this stuff asynchronous. And this stems from the logic of what an event really is. It is a notification that something relevant has happened. So it's something from the past. If you think about your message source, your event source, you may store your events till the end of time, from the start of your application, or at the very least you have a certain notion of retention period. 
So you may be handling events from a month ago or years ago. So there is no way that you can be synchronous with the publication of that event. It needs to be separated. So when you're building something like this, your event consumer is fully asynchronous from the logic of publishing that stuff. You need to have that separation in place. Likely why you went the event-driven route anyhow. Another thing that's very important, really coming in from the Deadletic queue perspective, is that a message could not or should not be delivered. Typically, when it comes to IT, that's because you have some exceptions. Something is going wrong. Well, this is painfully obvious, of course. A publisher has public, uh, publication exceptions and consumer processing exceptions. There's a bit more to it, though. When I think about the publisher failing, that is likely because technical implementation or the message source could not be reached for whatever reason. Those are more exceptions you get from a technical nature. That's not your business logic that fails because you already made the decision to publish an event and for whatever reason that didn't succeed because something's going wrong. All right, that's fair. So what does it mean to not be published? It means that it didn't happen yet. We don't have our effect that something has happened in the past. So yes, it is something that we can retry, but there are no downstream consumers concerned about this because there is no event to consume at all. So the impact is different on a consumer end. In the event consumer, this is where you have your logic, your business logic, to actually do something with your events, to start a, a process or a saga, so you will, or to update some projections. So this might be your business logic that actually fails. Still, technical exceptions also occur, but it's a broader perspective. So you want to react to this differently. And furthermore, and likely even more important, if an event could not be consumed that may have further impact on future processing because you expect a certain ordering in your events to take place. So if you handle event X that should have kick-started your process and then you still end up handling event Y after it failed, you miss some steps in your process or you miss some steps in your model. So that is very important to deal with that in a right way. There's another pointer in here that's very important, which I cannot really move to the publication end. And that's that a consumer, as its technical concern, can consume from several sources, or it can decide to do this in a multi-threaded fashion. So it needs a way to break down the message source or sources it has into distinct groups, into distinct sequences. You need to define the order of the events that make sense for the different threads you have. So sequencing comes into play when you're dealing with an event consumer as well. Let's combine this with the athletic queues. So if you think back about what a athletic queue is, something that where your messages that could not or should not be delivered are queued for later processing, if I'm being extremely honest, it makes sense on both ends, right? If it fails on the event publisher, you could still queue it and retry it at a later stage. That's fine. But as maintainers of such a project and builders of functionality for our users, on the event publisher end, it is very easy to make something like this. And likely, your message source, the technical component, has this in place already. It has something of a deadletic queue, perhaps. So why would we build that? Furthermore, the problem is more interesting. You need to deal with different types of exceptions that you want to react on differently. We need to deal something with sequencing. So what we did is we ended up to make a deadletic queue for the event consumer side. So that's also what I'm going to focus on. What it means for a deadletic queue on the consumption end of events, not the publication end even though that it makes sense on both sides. So let me change the diagram a little bit to give a feeling what it even looks like to do this, right? So we have our source, the events come from somewhere into the source, and this source pushes or the consumer pulls from that source to get the events. In the event consumer, you have your technical concerns of dealing with that sequencing, of having a certain layer of exception handling, of having a certain idea of threading in place. If you do it this way, you can reuse your event consumer locations as well. Still working? Yeah, nice. So the technical concerns of event consumption go to your event consumer. So that's not necessarily where you have your business logic. That's where you use different things, which I'd like to call event handling components. The event consumer has a set of these event handling components, which it invokes based on the events you have, and your business logic resides there. 
so that you can reuse your consumer and that your specific logic goes to that component. Like, for example, updating a projection and storing that in a database or triggering a certain type of process. Let's change the source to an actual sequence of events, going from one to nine, keeping it short, and let's actually start consuming those events. It's pretty basic. The consumer gets the event, gives it to the event handling component, but for whatever reason, at event five, our projection store decided to have technical issues. So, if we still give the event, what the consumer will do? Exception is thrown, given to the event consumer, and because we don't want to have problems for future processing, we simply stop the consumer, which is problematic. Right? This is where the deadletter queue comes in, of course. We add the deadletter queue and have the consumer go through this process. And the moment we reach that exception, we just move that event. Exception is still thrown, going to the consumer, but then moving it to the deadletter queue. So we're unstuck. Honestly, if you still have a technical issue, you need to deal with this. But sure, you can proceed. So you might be thinking, that's nice, Stephen, but we still have a regular bucket, right? We're not really doing anything with that sequencing point you made. So what about that sequencing when you're dealing with a dead letter queue? Well, that's just an added requirement of this component. Right now we have a very plain event stream and everything is the same, but you can assume that there is a certain level of sequencing policy, for example, based on the letter, because that defines a certain source where the messages come from. So the consumer can break down that stream into distinct sequences that it is going to consume. So if we go through this process again, removing all the exceptions, six and seven can simply be handled. But the event consumer just has a task to check, is there already a sequence in that, that letter queue, which I can add this event for? So that events belonging to the group D, so eight and nine, are also enqueued. That's what you want to do. You actually want to have those in there as well. You also want to enqueue those so that as a user of such a deadletter queue, you can ensure that the ordering of the events when you're handling is actually maintained, so that future processing, well, can still resolve on a retry. This means that we don't have a regular queue, we have a sequenced deadletter queue. You have a queue of sequences, or a queue of queues, so you will, where only the first entry actually had an exception when it came to handling, and the rest is all following from that order. So you would be reprocessing entire sequences instead of just single entries every time. That's actually one of the ones to share with all of you. This is the takeaway message, that you don't deal with just a regular dead letter queue, but a sequence dead letter queue. Um, see you nice on time. Still got some time for questions, I think. Regardless, thanks for being here. If you have any questions, this will be a good moment. Yes, we implemented this. Yes. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you can send then uh, messages to the dead, dead letter queue, but typically it's kind of not out, out of the box to easily query what's already there. Yeah. So that's what I believe Exxon Framework. Means. Yes, we have built this fully for Exxon Framework. We have components that we at least internally call event processors. And on that layer, you would define a dead letter queue and it takes into account that it needs to check for every event. Uh, yeah, because it needs to. So you definitely want to do some optimization there, right? Because for every event you handle, you need to check if you're going to do this. So it is quite a heavy task. But otherwise, how are you going to guarantee that your ordering is maintained? You want that ordering to take place. So. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Um, thanks for a good talk. Um, what kind of redrive policies do you have or are possible to implement? Yeah, lovely. I, I originally wanted to have some slides on that and then I was timing the amount of, well, time I have and it didn't really fit. Uh, when it comes to retry policy, we um, have logic in place that you can provide currently just a filter. It's a, conceptually, it's a predicate internally. And based on that, you select a sequence and then you reprocess the entire sequence. So you request from the implementation, okay, based on this predicate, I want to get a sequence. And then the, the original event consumer knows how to invoke the event handlers and does that for you one by one so that you're certain that you don't do a full batch and then somewhere in the middle of the batch fail. So that's 
currently is still an invocation the user needs to do. We wanted to have the initial API a bit simpler. Uh, we might do some automatic retries eventually that is, well, beneficial based on what people ask. All right. Hi. Thanks for the Thanks for the talk. Yes. Um, if we uh, if we have a hardware event that perhaps ends up with a lot of messages going to the dead letter queue, you know, in a very short space of time, I guess there could be a lot of matches and a, perhaps a lot of data to look up. So, how do you optimize the checks, you know, to see if something's on the queue? Yeah. And is there a risk of ending up into some kind of performance storm if there's a hardware issue? Uh, uh, if you use our stuff and you hit that performance penalty please reach out because I'd like to tackle that issue as well. We definitely did some tests uh, in this area uh, and we do feel that a certain level of caching needs to be introduced based on the sequence key. So the event consumer's task is based on the event to make that sequence identifier. It already does that internally, which needs to be a simple check anyhow. And then if you cache that, you're able to see, okay, I already have something or I don't have something. And then you can push it out. Or, uh, yeah, But there are there are definitely limitations I can imagine. I don't have rough ballpark numbers not right now, but good point. No. Thanks, Stephen, for the nice talk. It was a very informative information on DLQ. Mm -hmm. I have a question on a um, broader level, like uh, in, in this kind of uh, asynchronous environment where lots of components and there are moving part. How do you generally write integration tests since you are a maintainer of Exonic mm -hmm. uh, project, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you throw some light? What are the best practices? How can we do the integration test? Because integration test in nature is synchronous and this thing is asynchronous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true, true, true. So uh, when we were building this feature, we actually made a TCK, so a test, uh, test environment for any implementation of a dead letter queue because we provide several from within the framework as well. There's, there's an in-memory one, which well, it's not really persistent. We've got JDBC, uh, we're working on that, JPA, Mongo can envision all kinds of things, but the functionality needs to be the same all, all over the board. We got one dedicated on the DLQ, but we also got one that's more of an integration level that we actually make that event consumer have those event handling components and do that part of the flow. Um, yeah, we use notions of await. I'm not sure if you're using awaitility or if you're familiar with that, but it allows you to await for a certain time span and then validate some steps. Uh, back in the past, we did a lot of thread sleeps, which is extremely ugly in your tests, but yeah, you're dealing with asynchronous code and you need to wait until something has, uh, has finished. But you can also do that if you have a grander scheme of integration tests with Axon Framework, sure, that at the moment you're dispatching a command and then you're doing some logic and then publishing an event and you want that entire flow to take place. Well, on both ends, when you're doing CQRS, you have an entry point, the commands and the queries. So you have that query in your availability and the command is the trigger to start it off. That would be the most practical approach, I think. Sure thing. Um, my time is up, so I think I need to stop. So again, thanks for being here. I hope uh, you've been enjoying the talks. Yeah. <laughs>